and I've been, I've been uh, working in vegetation sampling for the last probably nine years and I've been focusing a little bit more on coastal wetlands the last six years. So I'll turn it over to Reed. Yep, my name is Reed Shorten and I'm an associate research specialist with the Lake Superior Research Institute. And we'll start right off here. I can select the slide there with a really brief uh, geology lesson. Um, basically, um, due to the large size of Lake Superior, the bedrock on the shorelines play a really important role with the formation of coastal wetlands, which is the topic tonight. And more specifically, uh, Lake Superior um, hasn't always been here. In the last 100,000 years, this part of the continent um, has experienced four major um, kind of retreats and advances of glaciers. The last being the Wisconsin, highlighted in orange on this map. Um, that, and all this played a pretty big role in forming the lake and then eventually the coastal wetlands that we find there today. So how do you form a, a coastal wetland? Um, basically, you need a sediment deposition. And that can, it mainly comes from uh, the input of sediment from um, tributaries along the Great Lake of Superior. Um, but also can, you can get some from shoreline erosion as well. And as you have a, a longer periods of sediment deposition, plants will eventually start to grow on that sediment, stabilize it, and that therefore increases further sediment deposition by slowing the water um, and building up organic material, which further um, shallowers the, or makes the water shallower. Um, and then as the water decreases in depth, you get a variety of different plants that can move in and eventually um, you'll end up with different uh, types of um, trees that will eventually move in as well. So this kind of just shows um, different stages you would kind of expect uh, throughout the deposition of sediment from a more open bog, which is actually floating, but there is sediment deposition or organic material building up on the bottom into a more um, sedge meadow. And then it, the trees will eventually uh, establish themselves. Now the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Consortium breaks down all of the wetlands within the five Great Lakes into just three different classifications. Up on the top left is the first type which is lacustrine and lacustrine is a Latin term for lake. When we see um, Carex lacustris is one of the plants we see that's lake sedge. This particular lacustrine example comes from Wisconsin Point. You can see the sand piping plover habitats in that um, sandy beach area that they're forming. So just to the right of that, you can see some vegetation. That is the lacustrine. Because it has large open water, they're typically associated with um, lake habitats. So there's lots of fetch to have wave action. It's usually a lot of inputs from sage and storm surges. And then you get some water inputs coming off of the land itself draining down. Uh, these are often more subject to impacts and they often may be some of the first to get invasive species. The second type we have is in the center that's riverine. This example is Sand Bay, which is in Wisconsin, part of the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, but it is on the mainland. And there's river, these riverine systems, uh, because they were formed by glaciers, we have some glacier, glacial rebound where the tectonic plate is still lifting but it's lifting faster on the north. So our southern shore riverine systems are getting drowned out. And that's why you're seeing more of these fingers coming, creeping into the wetlands. That's water inundation coming in. And these riverine systems are subject to both the uh, watershed, if there's nutrient loading or other things in the watershed, the sediments are going to be settling in the river mouth and you're gonna get the additional nutrients there, but they also have lake water coming in from the opening there. So they're experiencing temperature changes because Lake Superior is so cold. They're getting phy phytoplanktons moving in. Um, and this, we also have the sage coming in per very periodically, the two lunar, lunar sages throughout the day and then periodic sages based on pressure changes and the sloshing of the lake. And then the final one we have is a barrier system. These are typically uh, separated from the lake or nearly separated from the lake by some type of barrier. I don't know if Reed, you can show where that barrier is on pickle ponds. This is by Barker's Island, so close to home for everyone. Uh, that barrier itself is created by a man-made old railroad bed. Typically, they would be a sandbar. These are usually the least impacted, 
because they have uh, the separation from the lake, there's less wave action, there's less nutrient changes and temperature changes as well. So these are usually more stable environments. Unfortunately, that particular one, since it's man-made, experiences a little bit more um, negative impacts. And then down below, I have an example of all three. This is in the Kakagan Slough. And you can see on the top portion of that photograph, there is a sandbar, that's the barrier. And in the little crook of the arm, there is a, a wetland that is classified as a barrier wetland. And then there's an arm stretching out. I don't know if Reed, you can point that out too. The lacustrine wetland, yep. There's no riverine system involved in that. There's a lot of open water contributing to that. So it's basically just uh, rainwater and lake water that are affecting that. And then the riverine system is down below. So that's a good compact area to see the differences between those. Uh, next slide, please. And here we can see the distribution of these three different types of wetlands throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, Lacustrine is in yellow, riverine is in green, and barrier is in blue. And one of the interesting things to note is how many wetlands we have on the south shore of Lake Superior and the lack of wetlands on the north shore. And part of a huge part of that is from that the way the Great Lakes were formed and we have so much bedrock from the initial formation of the Great Lakes that coastal wetlands didn't really have the opportunity to form on that north shore very often unless it's shallow enough and sediments are able to build up. There's a lack of a lot of sediments in those areas and we have all of the different types of coastal wetlands down on the southern portion. It's interesting to note too that there's not a lot of lacustrine wetlands and I'm not an expert on that. I don't know why that is, but it's interesting to see. Next slide. Reed, I think you're muted. Yeah, I muted myself. Yep, thank you. So the functions of coastal wetlands variety all over the place. We've highlighted a few on this slide. Um, mainly though, what uh, you'd like to consider is the, the, the function that they will have going forward, especially as um, we start to potentially see more and more uh, things with our climate changing um, and the increase in carbon dioxide in the air. And what they do is they are great carbon storage locations. As vegetation grows, it will get deposited on site. And like Kelly mentioned earlier, the colder waters um, actually slow down the rate of decomposition in a lot of these areas, decreasing respiration, which is the main outsource of carbon dioxide from these locations. So as the water keeps it cool, um, you get less decomposition and therefore they eventually build up the carbon through organic matter over time. Uh Within these plant communities, as Reed said, these plants are typically very oligotrophic, which is nutrient poor. Because we have such cold water, because there's all this carbon storage and lack of breaking down of the plant material, they end up um, being very nutrient poor. So we've got examples being this cranberry on the left, that's our wild cranberry flowering. Not something you get to see that often, but it is a common plant in these higher quality plant communities. Then just to the right of that is the pitcher plant. That's our carnivorous plant that stores water in its pitcher and insects fall in and it's able to get additional nutrients from the insects that it's capturing. Then just to the right of that is one of our tiniest little sedges that we see in very high quality plant communities. It's really cute. It doesn't get any taller than about six inches and it only has a couple seeds at the very top. Um, and then just to the right of that is bog buck bean. This species sometimes tricks us. We think it's, it's an orchid when it's done flowering because of the shape of it. But these species are all um, not that uncommon. None of them are listed in either state as being special concern, but they're some of the first that we see to drop out when we start seeing nutrient loading or water level changes, something, some type of disturbance is happening, happening and we start to see the diversity dropping down. Uh, oh, and just before you switch slides, the bog buck bean and the cranberry are the only two of these four that we have seen in the St. Louis River estuary. The other two could be there, but we haven't seen them. You can switch slides. Uh, we're going to move from the deeper water into shallower water as we move through a couple of the common plant communities that we find throughout coastal wetlands. The deepest water would be our floating leaf submergent aquatic plant community. This is a example is from east of the Nemaji River mouth. In the background, you can see the flat gradient of the Osagi Trail. And um, these usually have a floating leaf component that's gathering sunlight. They also have submergent aquatic vegetation that can pull nutrients from the water column itself. 
And these provide great habitat for hunting and hiding fish. Um, they also have a lot of foods for waterfowl and macro invertebrates. Some of the common plants we have would be bladderwort, which is up at the top. It's got little, those little black pouches actually capture insects. Again, carnivorous getting nutrients from what it's capturing. Then below that we have coontail, which looks a lot like a milfoil. It's very common throughout the estuary. And then the center photograph is one of our yellow pond lilies, but it's the lesser pond lily, which um, in Wisconsin is special concern, I think it is listed. And Minnesota, it doesn't have a listing. So it depends on what side of the river we're on, whether we're gonna document it or not. But the way to tell that is that red disc in the center. The common one does not have the red disc. And then the final little plant would be a floating aquatic fern. And there's actually two types. This one doesn't get any larger than your fingertip, but it's incredible to think that we have aquatic ferns floating around. They're really common in the estuary. And then one final note for this um, plant community is that it's one of the first defenses for the shoreline erosion or um, impacts from the wave energy that's coming through. So a lot of the waves start to dissipate and sediments start to slowly fall in this area. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have emergent marsh and hemi marsh ecosystems. On the left in the Kakagan Slough, we've got wild rice with pickerel weed. Uh, these are great foods for waterfowl. Again, um, they're great fish habitat. On the right is more of a hemi marsh area. This is Alois Bay. And you can see wild rice again. This is part of a wild rice restoration project that we've been involved in for a while. It's growing with burr reed. But you can also see open pockets of water that have floating leaf and submergent vegetation. And those are important areas as well for the waterfowl because they can flush up if they need to. So they're safe habitats, but they can escape. These habitats also provide a lot of foods for them before they go into migration. Uh, we also have some common plants in this area would be the marsh sink foil, which is on the left. It's got kind of a tiny maroon flower, which is pretty cute. And then we have a cal wild calla in the center and blue flag iris, which occurs in a lot of our plant communities. Next slide. And here are some examples of cattail invasion. This is typically what a lot of people think about when they think of emergent marshes. Immediately cattail marsh comes to mind. These are usually a symptom of a greater problem, which often is the nutrient loading, which benefits cattail. Cattail is also going to outcompete native plants when there are toxic chemicals present or um, heavy metals, Alois Bay, which we have a photograph of, the Pollution Control Agency has actually listed finding 21 different heavy metals in the sediments from a couple different locations within Alois Bay. Uh, they also, um, so these areas are also kind of propped up on some of the woody debris from logging and the, the sawmill industries dumped a lot of woody material in as well. So some of the conditions of working in these cattail marshes or emergent marshes can be difficult walking through. You can see the path in the middle. Having gone through it before, it's hard to see the path and it's hard not to get stabbed in the eye. There are also a lot of times the logs underfoot can roll. We usually wear life preservers in case we find a hole in the root mat or the logs are rolling on us and we might slip and fall. So next slide, please. So kind of moving out of the shallower water communities into a floating community or the coastal bogs and, and sometimes fens or more commonly referred to as the peatlands worldwide. So these um, communities are defined by a, a number of things, mainly the presence of sphagnum moss in the bog. And how, what that uh, species is particularly important for a bog because in its uh, photo or it says, respiration and photosynthesis process that actually produces free hydrogen, which acidifies the water. And that uh, makes it kind of tough for a lot of species, more common species to grow at that location. So you kind of, you get these more especially adapt species um, pictured um, that will grow there. And then to separate that out from a fen, a fen is usually more neutral to higher pH. Um, so above seven, where it's usually contributed to some kind of groundwater intrusion with the um, going through a bedwalk that is alkalining the water levels. But uh, we normally see a lot more um, bogs in the coastal wetlands on the south shore at least. Um, but you get some really unique species such as the cotton grasses. Uh, certain species of um, sedges will only occur in lower pHs. 
there's a variety of orchids that like the lower pHs and then um, bog laurel and Labrador tea are another few. And then once outside of the floating, we move into the wet meadow, which is, this is a kind of a typical wet meadow, just very dominated by one species of sedge, which is Carex lacustris or lake sedge. Um, you will get other species growing within this, but um, it's mainly uh, just walking through this and you can slice yourself up pretty good on the leaf edges, so you gotta be careful. And this is uh, normally defined by the uh, water level being at or just below um, the sediment level. So it's a pretty solid base, but uh, it's still very uh, wet. And then after a while, these may um, eventually turn into our next um, type, which is a sh shrub scrub. Um, if it's dominated by alders, we commonly refer to, to an alder thicket. But this is where you have a lot of woody material, um, shrubs starting to move into the wetland complex. Um, there's a variety of different shrubs that can kind of dominate. Willows are also common, not as common up north here, but further south you see a lot of willows dominating these kind of habitats. Um, meadow sweet or Sperria gaea or Sperria alba dominate. Um, if it's a very acidic um, environment, leather leaf is usually the woody um, shrub that will take over. And, uh, and along with some, and then you, you also will see viburnum, uh, winterberry, dogwood, honeysuckle is a non-native species that can kind of come into these communities. And then within our estuary itself, um, a lot of the floating mats eventually get taken over by sweet gale or myrica gale. And then after a while, um, if there is enough sediment deposition and organic deposition, you may eventually transition into a, f a forested community, or in this case, a coastal floodplain, coastal floodplain forest, which um, is usually characterized by a high energy where there is a variable of water level um, throughout the season. Uh, it's normally dominated by black ash, um, which can be problematic with the ash borer. Um, balsam poplar is also a common tree species and sometimes silver maple will make it in there. If it's a relatively long lived site um, of saturated soils, um, northern uh, white cedar will sometimes move in if it's allowed to grow without any um, herbivory. And here we'll transition a little bit into how water levels can impact these coastal wetlands. These are some examples of long-term water level impacts on Lake Superior. These are just images from Google Earth. And on the left, we have Madeline Island Big Bay. You can see the current sandbar, which is a great example of a barrier or an embayment wetland. This has adult trees, white, mostly pines, white and red pines growing on them. And then you can see a little bit of a river, a kind of a river and opening up into the Back Bay Lagoon. But behind the Back Bay Lagoon, we see the original uh, barriers. Those are old sandbars. I don't know if you can point those out, Reed. These are old sandbars and in the center you can see probably where the original connection to Lake Superior was when the water level was a lot higher. Uh, and then there was probably again a Back Bay Lagoon, though I'm not sure. Uh, then again on the right we have Bark Bay. This is another one. There are a lot of examples that we can see on Google Earth of a barrier wetland that has an old remnant shoreline. And then this one, the communities actually put a road on it. Um, and this is also a good example of the different classification problems that the consortium can, some, can sometimes have. It's definitely a barrier wetland, but it also has a riverine system within it. So they have to decide which of those two classifications is making the biggest, driving the biggest changes to those wetlands. Uh, next slide. These are more short-term short changes. Uh, I went through August in 2010 uh, through earlier Google Earth imagery and just trace the outline of the mat, which looked like it was the most robust of all the last several decades. And then I just zoomed to the latest imagery to show how that mat has broken up over time. Now it looks kind of alarming because if you tried to walk a transect, you tried to walk a straight line through what was once floating mat, it's open water in a lot of cases, but this is really a natural process for these coastal wetlands. And without humans around to change things, there should be a latent seed bank for a different plant community. So the sedge meadow might break up and float away or sink, but there should be emergent marsh that takes over or um, floating a submergent aquatic vegetation. Uh, 
I was going to say one more thing, but I forgot. We can move on with this one. The next slide. This is an example of what it looks like from the field while you're in the canoe. This is on Clough Island. Uh, the circle is what we're actually looking at. There's a little bit of remnant floating mat left, um, but you can see the outline. I again went to 2010, traced what the floating emergent and uh, sedge metal mat was, and then went to 2017 to see how much we've lost of that mat. But as you can see, when we're looking toward that remnant mat, there's submergent aquatic and floating leaf vegetation. So it's functioning properly. It looks like there's probably some cattail out there. So that's a concern that if the invasive species are there when these are transitioning from one community to another, oftentimes the invasive species will be the ones that take over, but not necessarily. And then if we look, um, basically the photo on the right is if when we're standing on the edge of Clough Island and we're probably in our canoe, we turn around and look toward the island, we can see a lot of that woody debris that's very common throughout the estuary and especially along Clough Island. So sometimes when the water levels rise, those can become loosened and actually pull some of the sedge mat out with them, or they could sink. Those are what are typically rolling when we're walking. Next slide, please. Oh, I'll read your on mute again. Yeah. So Kelly kind of touched on these, but I'll go a little more depth into the, some natural stressors that can affect coastal wetlands. Um, something that's unique to Lake Superior is its seish, um, which is a gradual rising and lowering of the water throughout the day. Um, something you might have noticed if you've ever gotten into a boat and come back to the dock and found that you're a little lower or higher um, based on when you launched. Um, and this can be a lot more dramatic when, when storm surges uh, up here where it's a much greater increase in um, water depth. Uh, a little more relevant to right now is ice. So if the um, wetland sits below the uh, water line when it freezes, you can have ice impacting the vegetation growing there. And then even more dramatic is when you get ice um, shoves, which is when the ice is blown from the wind on the lake and piles up on the shore. And if you've ever been out to either um, either of the beaches, this is pretty dramatic and they can get quite high. I've seen them um, well over 10 feet high out at Wisconsin Point. Um, we were talking about how sediment plays an important role. Um, it can also have a negative effect on wetlands. If you have pulse fed sediments from the tributaries, this can really uh, decrease water clarity so that plants actually have to grow at a much shallower, shallower depth um, than they might normally be able to. Um, um, kind of decreasing the ability for them to expand outward. And then bank erosion, which um, depending on if you have a lakeshore property can be a, a big pain. This picture was taken at the, the Brule after a big storm, I think back in 2016 or 17. So that was a, probably about a good 20 um, feet of shoreline that eroded into the lake there. And China, um, this is, uh, we don't know quite the natural cause, but this is kind of the result of some of those natural disturbances here. Um, we have a wetland that um, we were surveying back in 2019. This was all a big cattail mat. Um, this is the mouth of the Namaji. And you can see where the cattail mat was. There's a big um, muck spot. I'm just sitting there. And there's a, if I return to this picture, this is kind of what was on there. So I doubt these aquatic vegetations were initially uh, this far above water. But this uh, mat, we ended up finding it probably uh, 200 yards away resting it against an old retired ore dock. So um, these natural stressors can have a pretty big impact on plant distri distribution, um, especially things that you don't want distributed throughout the estuary. Um, and this is free floating. So this could, if it eventually got out of this bay, it could reestablish anywhere else um, throughout the lake system, really. And then on the other side, we have a lot of human stressors and the top shoreline alteration, water level regulation, filling, dredging and drainage were all things that were initially done for our commerce for shipping. We have to keep a navigable channel throughout the Great Lakes. So Lake Superior's water level is probably not going to experience those larger swings in water levels because we need to keep it pretty stable now. A lot of the wetlands in the estuary were drained at some point and dredged to create these shipping lanes. They also put a lot of dredging into different materials, filling in some of the wetlands. And just from us doing all of this and us being around, there's just in general nutrient enrichment, which favors cattail and a lot of the other invasives like purple loosestrife 
and yellow iris and toxic chemicals as well and heavy metals that I had mentioned earlier. Road crossings actually do several different things besides increasing salinity in the water and sediments, which can as well impact invasives. They also have a lot of noise and disturbance to wildlife and other, area, and other um, macroinvertebrates and fish. And then in this instance, you can see how the road has, bise has dissected, bisected this wetland and kind of cut it off from itself hydro hydrologically. Uh, so they're no longer, unless there's maybe a couple culverts, which I don't believe there are, this is pretty common. So sometimes a wetland that was once completely connected can have different, um, maybe it can be a little more perched, a little drier on one side than the other. And in this instance, uh, we have aerial imagery from 1938. Uh, this is all public access. You can see all of Wisconsin from these 1938 images. We can see how much of the wetland has been lost over time, either from increasing water levels, but possibly from some of these other human stressors. And then Reed and I also surveyed just to the right of the road in 2017, and we came upon, it looks like a little clearing in both photographs. Um, just, yep, right in there. It was a Reed Canary grass kind of wet field, and we thought maybe it was nutrient enrichment happening because the landfill is to the south of that, and there's a small creek that feeds into that. But then when we look back at the 1938 imagery, it looks like it might have all been caused by this clearing for whatever purpose. I'm not sure what they did back then, but it still hasn't healed properly. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we've kind of covered all this um, information about coastal wetlands, we can kind of start digging into what Kelly and I um, kind of work on. So this is a product of a project um, both Kelly and I have been a part of um, through coastal um, Great Lakes Coastal Monitoring. We mainly handle a lot of the sites on the South Shore in Wisconsin. Um, and what it does is it basically compares the wetland, coastal wetlands throughout the Great Lakes um, using vegetation as a um, uh, kind of a marker of quality. And how it works is we go into a site, we try the Gather as or gather as much of the uh, vegetation data as we can based off of our protocols. Um, each uh, species that we observe is assigned a coefficiency of conservatism. Those are fed into an algorithm. That algorithm outputs a set number, and then you can compare that set number across the Great Lakes uh, region for uh, quality based entirely off of vegetation. And what this map kind of shows is. Um, while there are some impacted sites at, in Lake Superior, we have some of the more probably diverse and higher quality wetlands um, in the Great Lakes region, um, especially compared to the more industrial sites. But um, as we'll move into this map, next map will show, um, there are still a lot of community stressors in the Lake Superior Basin um, or watershed, and which is uh, this map is showing a basically a dot for every residential home within the watershed. Um, it's not um, or specific, but it's generally where a house would be. And you can kind of see if we were to look back at that other um, map that a lot of the quality of the wetlands kind of correspond with these higher densest um, locations on this map. I know there are a lot of organizations doing coastal wetland research and wetlands and research in the wetlands, so we're not experts on this. There's a lot going on, but some of the projects that we've been working on include the Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. I think that was initiated around 2010. I think LSRI has been part of it since then. Um, I didn't join until 2015. And then there was a similar project that focused mainly on the riverine coastal wetlands in Wisconsin, which used the same protocols, but they were also attaching some stream morph geomorphology data to that. So they sampled the streams and the coastal wetlands. Um, and then Alloys Bay Wild Rice, I think has been start, started somewhere around 2010. And that was up until this year, we were still seeding out there uh, and monitoring how the rice was doing. We also have an early detection program looking at coastal wetlands. It's um, the Wisconsin DNR initiated it in 2017. And it's basically searching for species that are on a list that they are considered to be very detrimental if they get into the wetlands. So we're hoping that if they do, we catch them right away and can report them and do something about them before they become a problem that we cannot control. And then there's another project that's been ongoing for the last couple of years with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that Reed is working on. And um, he's basically navigating throughout the estuary to different points and taking 
the submergent and floating leaf aquatic vegetation samples from those from quad rats. And someone else on our team is doing some sediment samples to see if the plant species composition can tell us anything about the sediments once we compare the two. And then as plant researchers, we have several different methods that we use to answer different questions. So all of our projects have different objectives and for the coastal wetland monitoring project, our objective is to look at changes in the size of coastal wetlands over time, as well as the species composition over time. So we use a transect quadrat. And this photograph shows a quadrat. It's a meter squared by a meter squared. And while we're out there, we survey every, we write down every plant we see in that quadrat. And then as Reed was saying, they each have a coefficient of conservatism and we get that quantitative metric. Uh, the transect is placed in the same location. Every year we go back to the same line through the, through the wetland. We place five quadrats along that line in each plant community. So we can see how it's changing each time we visit it. We also have something called a meander where we get to walk through the wetland and pick where we go. And we get to base that kind of more on our intuition. So if we're doing early detection surveys, we're looking for changes within that same plant community. We're not looking to cover the whole community. We're just looking to see this all looks normal. We know it's here, but this over here, there's a darker green over here. That could be something else. So it allows us to follow our own instincts. Um, and then we also have floristic quality assessments, which are kind of, we write down all the species we see, we walk a path, that looks like it's still within the same plant community and it gives us a kind of a timestamp at this day on this time, this is the quality of that wetland. Um, and then the final one would be like a grid point intercept, which is what Reed does kind of for his MPCA project. We establish an equally divided grid over that plant community or wetland. So the points are evenly distributed. Those are loaded into a GPS and then we navigate directly to those points and either do a quadrat like you see in the photograph or we do something larger, which is called a releve, which can be 10 meters by 10 meters or 20 meters by 20 meters, depending on the vegetation. Next slide. So what do we do with uh, some of this or a lot of this data and part of just a piece of it can be um, control and restoration work. Um, we're not primarily involved, but we've done a, a bit of this over the years we've worked. Um, control is really can be broken down into three uh, main methodologies. A chemical, which is a um, hopefully a targeted spray on invasive species that we want to remove from a wetland that may be impacting um, that wet, wetland negatively. Um, this can also be done mechanically where we actually go and physically remove this, the plant from the location, either by hand as we're doing in the center photo uh, with cattail or um, through machinery um, and some other possible methods. And then finally, biological control, which the poster child for this um, in the Great Lakes is purple loosestrife, where they release beetles that are specifically um, targeting purple loosestrife um, and will hopefully damage the plant enough where it will either decrease its ability to reproduce or enough to even kill it. But it's not enough just to control these species because as soon as you control something, you're basically creating a disturbance. And normally a lot of these species come in through disturbances. So you're basically opening them back up to having another species either come in or even the same species being reintroduced from your disturbance. So we wanna do some restoration work on top of any control. Um, uh, like Kelly mentioned earlier, uh, in a site well that maybe has the conditions that allow it, wild rice makes an excellent restoration plant because it's annual, it's fast growing, and it tends to be pretty um, uh, nutrient tolerant to some degree. Um, this also can take the form in bringing in species, uh, native species plugs of native vegetation that uh, is already at the location, just kind of bringing it into the site um, and filling in the gaps that uh, have been uh, disturbed by the uh, any control that we've done. And this is our final slide. We wanted to leave you with some observations and thoughts that we've had from all of our years of surveying coastal wetlands. First, this is one of the highest quality top five, if not the highest quality coastal wetland we have been to. This is on Madeline Island. It's called Bog Lake. It's different from Big Bay, which is more in the center of the, the island. Um, we have to take a boat to get there. There are no roads, so we can't take the ferry. We have to take a, one of our LSRI boats and we put a canoe on top of that and we're kind of packed in there. It takes about an hour to boat out to the location and it's on the northern portion of the island. It's a barrier wetland and it is completely separated from Lake Superior, which adds to a lot of the reason why it's in such good condition. 
So in between, there's a gap in the trees on that right-hand photo. That's where we haul the canoe over the sandbar, and then we have to haul it through some of the wetland to get to some of the open water so we can paddle through. And once we're there, we have about three hours tops to do the surveys we have to do, and we want to spend probably closer to three days because it is so cool out there. So we're frantically trying to get our surveys done. This particular wetland is iconic of what an oligotrophic uh, plant community should be on Lake Superior. We don't see any invasive species here. It's pretty stable, easy walking on the ground. And year after year, we don't really see any changes. And this is because it's pretty disconnected from Lake Superior, though the lake can still cross that barrier wetland in cases of storm surge or some ice scouring. Um, but other than that, it's not really subject to any human, uh, you know, the roads can't get people there and people aren't typically going in the wetlands unless they're doing research. Uh, so this fortunately is here intact and we have more than just this out there. There's a lot of really high quality wetlands that are hard to get to on the Apostle Islands, but there are also some more closer to home like Bark Bay and Lost Creek that have some invasive species, but there's still, there are pockets that look like this. So it's very encouraging, especially when, when what we see in the St. Louis River estuary doesn't always seem like it's um, in very high quality any longer. Uh, however, it, the St. Louis River estuary does still contain about 25 different oligotrophic species. Some of them are very common. Wire sedge and bog birch and bog buckbean, those are things that we see a lot once we get past those cattail kind of embankments, the cattail marshes we have to go through. But when we're out in these habitats and we know that we have these remnants of oligotrophic species, um, it always brings to mind what did the estuary used to look like? That's something that I've always been curious about. And I happened to come across uh, a summary of what it was like as a European settler going up the mouth of the river in the St. Louis River Citizens Action Committee put together their lower St. Louis River habitat summary from 2002. So I just have a couple sentences that is the closest I found to what the estuary was probably like. It said, from the mouth of the river to the rapids, above what is now the Fond du Lac neighborhoods, most early travelers described a wide, shallow river with extensive emergent wetland vegetation, including floating bog and beds of wild rice. The vegetation was so thick that it was often difficult to follow the main channel. And that's incredibly different from what we see now. But it is encouraging that we still have those oligotrophic species there. And we have done a lot over the years to stop our nutrient loading and to clean up some of the areas of concern. And we've been controlling invasive species and I believe we'll continue to control them even further once these areas are more cleaned up. Um, so eventually I think we will have some semblance of these oligotrophic plant communities back and they'll be fairly functional, I hope. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening tonight and we'll take the remainder of the time for any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Kelly and Reed. This is awesome. And I learned so much listening to you and there's a, actually a ton of questions. <laughs> so I'm gonna dole them out to you um, kind of in the order that they came. Um, some uh, Elizabeth wanted to know what causes sage. And there's lots of estuary people here that can help you. <laughs> uh, well, I've had it explained to me that the bathtub situation where the lake water is kind of sloshing and that's pressure dependent. So if there's a low pressure system on one side of the lake, the high pressure is going to be causing water to change from one side to the other. And then it's just kind of a reverberation as well as the, the lunar to, um, I believe it's around noon. There's noon and midnight, there's a lunar sage that comes in. And I think that they can change from around 20 centimeters per time. It's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so uh, there's a question Marie fielded from Dean. Um, can you comment on the cattails in the wetland set aside areas? And I wasn't sure what he meant by wetland set aside areas, but maybe you all know, or uh, Dean would share with us. Yeah, I'm not sure what the set aside areas. I'm uh, assuming they're just kind of referring to any areas that are um, like not being actively um, like maintained or something or set aside for just the pres preservation of the wetland and just the effect of cattails in those locations is kind of what I'm assuming 
they're talking about. Um, as far as, I mean, cattails still um, provide an important role. Any vegetation can provide an important role, to, even if it is something that we might not appreciate as a native species. Cattails do a really good job of actually absorbing a lot of heavy metals out of the water column, um, which is why you probably shouldn't eat any of the, the cattail within the estuary. The, they can have a higher um, heavy metal um, concentration than the, even the surrounding water. Um, but they do remove it and they do actually do some um, water uh, purification and slow the, uh, they slow sediment deposition um, in the river and also um, kind of act as buffers between the shoreline so you don't get shoreline erosion as well. So they, despite um, all the negative press cattail gets, they do actually still provide, they're better than nothing basically. Um, so they do still an important, uh, play an important role. And if just to remove them, just to remove them out of um, the sake of their cattail is probably not always the best idea. You always want to, like we talked about earlier, bring in something else that is going to provide the same function um, as that species was providing. And due to the just vast acreages that some of these cattail patches can take up, that's easier said than done for the most part. I've totally eaten them. <laughs> I think I fed them to Ryan too. Um, uh, so Karina was wondering if you could explain the co coefficient of conservatism a bit more and what that means. Uh, I can go ahead and do that. Basically every plant in Wisconsin and in Minnesota, they have separate CFCs, but in Wisconsin, every plant gets a value from zero to 10, zero being invasive species or non-native species that can grow anywhere, essentially, anywhere within their habitat means. And 10 would be species that we have listed as threatened and endangered. A lot of orchids are in there. They're species that are not tolerant of, of changes, even natural changes. So water, change, water level changes and flooding and those types of things, those would be the first to leave. Um, and then somewhere in the middle are ones kind of like the blue flag iris. They can grow in a lot of locations, but once it gets to be too far de degraded, they can't grow there any longer. So then these numbers are all averaged out to give us our metric that we can compare one wetland to another. And then on top of that, we also have something called a cover class. When we're surveying within a um, quadrat, we will say this particular species which has a coefficient of conservatism of three, which is maybe like um, Canada blue joint, it has a cover of 70%. It's shading out all the other plants around it by 70%. It's taking up 70% of that quadrat. So then that is multiplied to give us what we call a weighted C. And that just takes into account how much of it is in that, in that quadrat. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think Doug was wondering um, what in invasive species are you looking for as part of ED effort? I'm not sure what ED means, but. Um, so yellow iris has been reported to me at Boy Scout and Rice's Point, Rice's Landing, um, Rice's Point Landing, sorry. Uh, we also have it on Barker's Island. Um, there will be a response to those infestations next summer. Has yellow iris been found in other locations? Yes, it has. I'll address the yellow iris first. We're considering controlling some yellow iris in Eloise Bay. There is a lot by Power Squadron. We found it in lesser numbers out by Red River Breaks. It's fairly ubiquitous, but it's not as visual. It's not as um, dense as cattail would be. Uh, it, in most cases, if it isn't a very large problem, it's not being addressed right now. Uh, as far as the ED, that's early detection, and those are a different set of species than the cattail and yellow iris and purple loosestrife. They're things that hopefully aren't here yet, but have the potential of invading these areas. One of them that we have begun to find is called Queen of the Meadow. And it, it happens to be pretty prolific in Duluth. Um, driving up past Brighton Beach, I just noticed it flowering this past summer. And it's a really pretty flower, uh, big and white and pretty tall. And the leaves look kind of like uh, raspberry. And that's been starting to pop up in some of the wetlands in Wisconsin. But otherwise, there are things that aren't here yet. And we're hoping they don't get here. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad you're watching for them. 
That's what it, that's something I worry about. So likewise, similar, um, Tim is asked about Phragmites and Phragmites invasions and Doug uh, provided an update in the chat there about Phragmites and the work that's been done. Um, but anything that you would add? I can take this one. Um, so we, we do see Phragmites, uh, it's mostly the native subspecies. So if you're familiar with how ta plant taxonomy is broken down, um, you have a species which is made up of a genus and a specific epithet, and then they can be further categorized if they're closely related, but not quite enough to separate them out as species. You can have a subspecies, and uh, what people are mainly concerned about is a subspecies Australis, but there is a native subspecies of Americanus. Um, we tend to find Americanus. Um, usually it's very, it's a lot less aggressive than the Australis subspecies, um, but um, we do find it. And in some locations, it's actually um, become problematic. Uh, Lost Creek is one that comes to mind. There's a large um, population of Phragmites uh, subspecies Americanus there um, that the DNR is a little concerned about. Um, but for the most part, it kind of, is it grows a little more sparsely with the native vegetation. Very similar to how our native cattail, so we have a native broadleaf cattail that um, usually you will see it kind of growing speckled throughout a wetland and not aggressively taking over as a monoculture throughout. So yeah, um, as far as the non-native non subspecies Australis, um, we haven't, I don't think we've come across it in any uh, sites specifically. I think it's more of a problem on the Minnesota side. Yeah. Like maybe Grassy Point area. I know there's a population that's not in the coastal wetland, but um, close by there. Yeah, there's a, a few hanging on. Um, Glyphwick did a really comprehensive um, finding, invite, uh, finding Phragmites and then removing them. Um, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission a couple, couple years back now and it's, it's nice. It's really, really good idea. We, um, our sister reserve down in Ohio, you can't get through places because of the Phragmites. It's something else. Um, yeah, I've seen sites like that in Green Bay. I believe it's a major issue over there. In yeah. Washington. Yep. Green Bay, same thing. Yeah. Um, so Tim had another question here and it says, has there been any studies on the sediment or soil to record changes over time or to find relationships between changes in habitat? I'm not totally sure what he means about the second one, but I'll just leave it, leave it there. Yeah, I can take this one. Part of our project with coastal wetland, wetland monitoring also includes sediment. We're not sediment scientists, but we stick, like you can see in the photograph that's still up, reeds carrying a conduit and the two meters uh, meter sticks, the conduit, the metal conduit we shove down into the soil. Usually we describe how much organic material is there and then down to whatever substrate is at the bottom. And then we categorize what we think it is based on feel or what comes up in the conduit. And then um, I don't know if they're doing any research with that particularly yet. And I don't know of research that's been done other than that. Usually taking a soil sample is pretty common when you're doing vegetation sampling in wetlands. Um, I think Reed is doing that with the MPCA projects. Uh, some another counterpart is sampling the, the sediments. Um, but I, there was also a study on bringing it back to the Phragmites too in Bark Bay, where it's native Phragmites, and they were wondering how, if it, it was actually native, if it's always been there, or if it's something that's been introduced due to nutrient changes over time. And they used, I believe, pollen cores. And I'm guessing they were taking it out of the sediment and the peat that has accumulated there to see if the, that would show that how long the um, Phragmites has been present there. Yeah. All right, so uh, Marie had asked earlier and you referenced it later in your talk a few times, but the, she asked about the lagoon at the town park on Madeline Island. Um, she said, it's so amazing. Um, if you've done work there, what can you tell us about it? I can 
Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think which, because there's a few different lagoons I'm in. Yeah, about. I think she means Big Bay uh, Town Park. Yeah, if they're referring to Big Bay specific, yeah, that is probably, um, uh, the picture actually that's up right now is the Bog Lake, which is the other um, site on Madelon Island. And I would say they're um, equally as impressive. I haven't spent as much time in the Big Bay um, side as uh, Kelly could probably speak a little more on that, but um, yeah, they're both very impressive sites. I'd love to spend a lot more time in there. Yeah, I think when we were out there, we did a um, a little bit more through the coastal bog, which was in kind of what possibly could have been the historic Back Bay Lagoon rather than the current Back Bay Lagoon. But we found, I think maybe three to four listed species of special concern and, and threatened while we were out there and we weren't we weren't doing a rare species survey. So it, it's one of those special always remember trips that we got to spend out there. Yeah, Apostle Island wetlands are pretty amazing, beautiful places. Um, quick question here, Doug was wondering if Queen of the Meadow is the same as Queen Anne's Lace? They are different and Queen Anne's Lace is much more common. And I think you would typically find it in more dry areas, roadsides and fields. Um, the queen of the meadow you might find on roadsides, but it'd be more wet ditch type roadsides. All right, so there's a question here from Aaron. He said, when you showed the map of wetland condition across the Great Lakes, it showed many top condition wetlands within the Lake Superior Basin when judged with the entire Great Lakes Basin. But has there been work to look at this comparison with within just the Lake Superior Basin. Further, does the Coastal Wetlands Monitoring Program only break classification down by HGM? And any discussion of looking at it from a plant natural community perspective instead? I can take a little bit of this. Um, so um, I'm pretty sure they've broken the lakes down individually. Um, for conditions. Um, this is just an overall comparison, kind of to showcase um, Lake Superior in general being a pretty high quality when it comes to coastal wetlands um, when compared to across the lakes. But I think that if you, you would see similar trends, um, just being familiar with a lot of these wetlands, you would see similar trends um, if you were to just look at Lake Superior where a lot of the sites near um, uh, concentrations of, you know, people, large cities and such. Uh, though maybe not so much at Thunder Bay, but there isn't really wetlands up there. Um, you could see a degradation on a lot of the wetlands. As far as, let's see, further does it go to wetland? Uh, I'm not familiar with HGM, that terminology. Um, Aaron, would you like to pop, pop in here and and help us out with the rest of this question. Hydrogeomorphonic. Oh, got it. Okay. Oh. Okay, sure. Um, there, they potentially. Well, I, I'm. I'd have to talk to the people that are kind of analyzing this data. We're we're kind of on the ground and such, but I'm. I wouldn't be. I would be surprised if they aren't uh, looking at those um, factors as well. Yeah, I think it. It'll depend on what experts they have involved and who's willing to, to look into the data because all of the data for all the Great Lakes is being compiled and it's an ongoing effort. So it's, I think it's just been renewed for another five years, if I'm not mistaken. And so then that final question about plant communities that will probably also be addressed as well, specific plant communities and their health throughout each Great Lake and then potentially across the board. So um, got just a couple minutes left, but two questions here. Um, are there any analyses of trends and changes in the wetland vegetation since the program began or anything you would observe just from your own experience too, I think would be- I'll be let uh, Kelly have this one. She's done the coastal wetland monitoring a lot longer than I have. Uh, I think back in 2015 is when I started and I've revisited some of these wetlands two or three times, and most of them I visited at least once. And the main trend that I have noticed is that higher water level 
and not just breaking up of vegetation mats, but the species composition has changed from a higher diversity with a lot more flowering species, like there's a marsh bellflower and a long leaf bluet or something marsh, I can't remember what the common name is, but those have vanished for the most part as the, the plant communities start to kind of trend more inland and a lot of the alder thickets, the alders have died but it's uplifting to see that underneath the alders, we're seeing sedge meadow come back and we're seeing the emergent marsh where the sedge meadow was. So it seems like for the most part, it's, it's functioning the way it's supposed to. And I haven't seen a whole lot of um, invasive species trends as far as invasive species growing at incredibly fast rates. I think Alloys Bay, maybe we've been monitoring that a little closer, but um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty encouraging. And I think as the water levels drop, we'll see that reverse over time. Yeah, it's been really interesting to watch it. Um, even though sometimes it is a little upsetting because it's a lot of, a lot of dead alders. Um, so William was asked, uh, what is the objection to non-native species? Which is a big question. There's a lot of, a uh, lot of things to know about that, but maybe you could just summarize it up and a minute or less. <laughs> um, I've heard just recently, Reed can add to this too, but I've heard one of the recent things was that these invasive species often, besides just creating monocultures, they're replacing a lot of diverse species that are providing food sources for um, pollinators as well as migrating birds and other animals throughout the season. And these monocultures are coming in and they're only providing one food source for one time throughout the summer like cattail or purple iris are only providing it in the fall. And sometimes it's less nutritious and the um, wildlife has adapted to eating those specifics. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, I think we're good. I mean, we can go all, this could, that's a whole nother, that could be an entire river talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be something to consider. Um, if Doug Jensen's still here, it might be the river talk in the future. Um, all right. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I loved your photos. It's really great to hear about some of these wetlands and, um, and the work you do. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for coming. Our next River Talk is February 10th. Uh, we will also be here in Zoom and um, watch for information about that on, on Facebook and usually in the Duluth News Tribune. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks.